Uh, thank you, Shudip, and uh, uh, I have to. <coughs> okay, uh, thank you. And uh, as Shudip said, this is the uh, last talk of the school mode, so we can be relaxed, and it's also evening talk, so we have all the right to be relaxed. And since we had fantastic talks in the morning, we can take things a little easy. But you know, still, we are in the school mode, so I don't think we should be that relaxed. So I have noted a few questions for you already on the board. <coughs> this is a recapitulation of three textbook questions, which you should be knowing the answer on your hand immediately. What is the unit of h by u square? Secondly, what is the unit of magnetic flux quantum? Third, <coughs> if I take a, say, one picofarad capacitor, charge it with, say, 10 kilo ohm, then I know that V is equal to Q by C, then I should be seeing a straight line. But we are taught from the very beginning when we started our science learning that electronic charge is quantized. So why don't I see that? For if you do the experiment, you'll see that. So why don't I see that? So you should be having this question in mind and try to see if they'll get an answer. And then in the talk, I'll be raising two questions. From the beginning, I'll be asking that all the precision measurement in the metrology are done with the highest possible <coughs> precision. But do they mean anything to the marketplace where they'll be actually being used? Like I want to buy a kilogram of tomato, does it mean much that I have the mass metrology done at few parts per billion? <coughs> I'll convince you that it is absolutely necessary for if things are not that done to that precision, there's a tremendous loss of the economy comes. Someone lose <coughs> lots of money. <coughs> and, <coughs> sorry, last question <coughs> again, physics question. I can take define current by charge by time or charge into frequency. I can also define current through Ohm's law, that is voltage by the resistance. Are these two definitions equivalent? And what does these experiments have to tell us? So <coughs> with these questions in mind, let us see what we have to discuss. And I am very happy that the school has been arranged. And uh, uh, there are actually a lot of topics initially discussed that we could cover in the school. But then time constraint and other constraint, it was decided that <coughs> it will be focused on a class of topics and fantastic topics have been chosen. So in my uh, presentation, along with trade, I'll sprinkle a little bit of electrical measurements, mainly with the idea that is how I translate <coughs> <laughs> a measurement which is done in a metrology lab to an user place, and there is a process by which it goes. Those who are here for the first time, very close by, there's a fantastic place. If you like classical Indian dance, it's worth visiting. This place is called Nitya Gram, that is uh, very close by. It is just 10 kilometers west from here, next to this lake called Hasaghata Lake which supplies or used to supply water to Bangalore. This house is a Gurukul of dance. <coughs> now seven Gurukuls are there. It was established by the famous dancer Pratima Bedi. And uh, it's a very unique experience. Completely runs on donation, no government money, nothing. She actually had a very tragic death. She went for the pilgrimage to Kailas Manas Sarvar. There was an avalanche and she died. And that was in 1980. <laughs> in 1998 or something of that class. Now, they have contributed heavily to the <coughs> cultural life of Bangalore. They used to hold a spring festival called Vasant Happa. And unfortunately, due to uh, donation problem, they stopped at 2005. I used to regularly attend and used to come very nearby. The ICTS was still a barren field at the time, nothing there in concept. And believe me, in the last 2004 concert, there was 40,000 people live sitting on the ground. 
listening for at least eight or nine hours. So, you know, this is kind of a very colorful part of Bangalore, which you may not have seen. So if you can arrange a transport, you can see the Nitragram is worth visiting. Well, <coughs> come back to the talk and precision measurement and meteorology has been actually discussed by Dr. Fred Riley and particularly we have two persons from PTB, <coughs> Dr. Riley and Dr. Mulz Staubler. Now, this is one area we physicists would like to ponder. But believe me, there is a huge thing from trade side. So do they mix? And what this talk will try to discuss, is there a bridge between these two and how I cross the bridge? So that is essentially the theme. And crossing the bridge is not only just rules and regulations and negotiations and all that. <coughs> there is a question, sorry, tools, techniques, and physics in that. So I'll have my talk essentially divided into two parts. First part, I'll be pointing out briefly that metrology or a very high precision measurement is extremely important to trade, particularly international trade, and how they are organized agreements and the process. <laughs> Second, I go to the part two, will be essentially the question of charge and which is, you know, that are defined in the electronic charge. How do I go to ampere and the meteorology triangle for electrical units? And particularly now the current day attempts to make programmable quantum current source, which actually feeds directly into the high precision metrology and calibration of equipments like digital current meter and all that. <coughs> so let me start with the first part. So if I ask you the question, that what is the main motivation for the precision measurement? All of us in this room will answer, of course it is physics, for you want to do physical measurements with the best possible <coughs> precision, lowest uncertainties, and that is what we physicists to do. And we'll to understand the physical law better, whether there's a deviation here and there can give a lot of significance. For instance, you know, we all know one by R square, right? That is the famous <coughs> Coulomb's law. Now, suppose that two in the one by R square is not two, but 1.999999998. What should happen to the universe? That is another question you should have in mind. That you will immediately see that will give a finite photon mass. And if you have a finite photon mass, everything in the world may change. And believe me, that the first experiment I wanted to do after my postdoc after my PhD, <coughs> worked for eight months and failed due to one problem. I, if I get time at the end, I'll tell you that is how sometimes precision experiment really fails due to very small issue. And that is where the uncertainty, which Riley has pointed out, really counts. But that will be at the end if I get time, if there's a question answer. <coughs> <coughs> well, I'll be telling you that there's an alternate and parallel view, which is not exactly orthogonal to the first view. And that is $26 trillion worth of international trade today. And that is completely dependent on precision measurement and metrology. It's unbelievable, but it is so. <coughs> and Dr. Riley has already said that you have the SI units today, redefined in 2018. The Bureau of International Waste and Measure in Paris defines that. It comes to the National Meteorology Laboratory. And then it goes to the soft floor and the market. And it is exactly for this reason that the large industrial economies in the world actually spend a lot of time, or a lot of money through the <coughs> realization of the SI units and then the maintenance and realization. Of course, physics measurements are important. But more important is that you know how to translate it in the marketplace. Now, this you have seen many times. And this is the seven sisters of, I call it the modern unit. And it has all been defined that, you know, like these are the units we have. And <coughs> the fundamental things that are defined now is the <coughs> I want to find frequency of cesium and the velocity of light. H, 
Avogadro's number, Candela, KB, and uh, E. So this essentially defines all the measurements that we do in the world today, and that the way we should be doing it. Now, <clears throat> so what happens is that there are sacrosanct physical constants. Don't ask them that whether there is an uncertainty. They have been defined by years of measurement. The best value has been achieved. And I have taken to a fantastic metrologia issue that came out into it. And these are the physical constants. And look at it, there is no uncertainty. So by definition, these are the things which are defining your inuin today. And they don't have any uncertainty. Anything else you do will bring in the uncertainty. So they have fixed values. And, <coughs> and you can see that even the last straw of the metrology kilogram, which was still defined by a hunk of metal, is now replaced by age. And you know, when you start studying physics, you'll never think that something like Planck constant have anything to do with the kilogram. And believe me, kilogram today is defined by age. So let us see how it is done. <coughs> You got stuck here or what? Ah. Ah, okay. <coughs> now, so what is the problem? The problem that you are talking up is that the best unit definition is realized in the best of labs in the world around. You have PTB, NPL, Teddington in UK, you have NIST, you have the Japanese lab, you have the Chinese lab, you have the Korean lab, they all come over here. Then we also fit in, in NPL India. And then you have the user industry. And this bridge is done by what is called the calibration labs. And there is a process by which it is done. And my first part of the talk will be essentially exposed to the process, but it is better you know that, or it is as useful as knowing the units. <coughs> a bit of a fun slides, couple of them, for we are talking of evening talk. Are we using units globally? The same unit in two countries in the world, you can still buy milk in gallon and pint. You ask them a liter of milk, they will have a said, this guy must have come from another planet. He's asking for a liter of milk. No, we sell it only in gallon and pint. And the rest of the world, like in Bangalore, you can buy in half a liter of a sachet or a one liter of a long life milk. <coughs> And believe me, in the countries where they are buying milk in gallon, they're still thinking about metric. You know, there's a shop in USA called Radio Shack. I don't know how many of uh, people know that. It's to sell small, uh, you know, gadgets. In the sense, like boards, circuit boards. And you can put components and make gadgets from it. Last page of that was think metric. I started my PhD in USA in 1975. I still see the... the Think metric ad. <laughs> so by drinking a gallon of milk, you are still thinking metric. <clears throat> okay. Now there's another part that we don't realize that it is BIPM may define a unit, but often in the real marketplace, the unit can be defined by the seller and buyer. So let me ask a question. <clears throat> you know, this puffed rice, which is called in most part in Murmura in Bengal, Muri, how do you think it should be measured? Few hundred grams, 50 gram, 200 gram. If we eat a lot of them, maybe a kilogram. Kilogram is very difficult to eat. Believe me, in Bangalore, they sell it by a liter. So you go to a shop to buy Munubra, you tell them, give me 200 grams, they will have a good laugh. You can say, take a liter. So they're the first example where a solid is sold in a liquid volume. So it happens. Well, <laughs> even in financial units, Believe me, there are user-defined units. Like one unit is called Peti, which is about 10 million rupees. They have another half box called Copra. And uh, we don't use them. They're used by the underworld dons of Bombay. So, you know, like everyone has a unit. And you know, we have to use the unit. Okay? But sometimes it can cause a global disaster if the units are not proper. I'll give an example, and this is taken from NASA's site. So there is no WhatsApp university involved in it. So 
See, NASA sent a Mars Climate Orbit. It's a fantastic project for a deep Mars exploration. <laughs> it's one of the best uh, Mars polar lander made by them. But the mission failed because the instruction was given in pound and foot. The system understands only centimeter and <coughs> meter and kilogram. So it lost in translation. And believe me, it crashed because you know the unit was not proper. And this is stated again in massive studies, as you said. So it was supposed to last for 10 years, lasted just barely not even one year. So it's very important that we talk in this time of length. Now, <clears throat> the most important thing that has happened in the world of units, as Dr. Riley must have pointed out, that is the October Revolution of 2018. The political October Revolution was in 1917. So it is exactly 101 years after the political October Revolution. And the biggest resolution was that will abandon all artifact based units and go into the physical concept based definition. Why? For you know, if your unit is based on the king's foot, then when the king dies or the queen dies, you got to redefine the foot. That's bad, right? Every time your king dies or the queen dies, you have to redefine the unit. You shouldn't do that. And the problem even takes a kilogram. Believe me, kilogram drifted. Even the standard kilogram, and it depends on how you wash it. It is kept in a fantastic vessel. But every time you take it out for weighing, you lose. I think in the last 20 years, it was measured at 70 years, loss of 35 microgram or 40 microgram. That was the problem. Then physicists think that, you know, why not we define everything in terms of H, C, E, and units of that kind? So, you know, now kilogram is defined in this unit, which is essentially where H comes in. <coughs> so it is 1.4755 to 1 for 10 for 40 H. This is your frequency standard divided by C squared. Fantastic definition, and it is realized. But the only problem is that you don't go to a market and tell me, give me 1.4755 to 1 for 10 to 40 H new C by C squared potato. So the guy who is selling potato will think you are mad, he will not sell anything to you. So you have to really define a kilogram. So that is where the important comparison came. This I have taken from <coughs> the com consultative committee of unit of the BIPM, which is very important. And you can see there are two ways now they are. One is the cable balance, which is used to be called the watt balance, and the you know crystal uh, silicon crystal technique. And they have to agree to within 10 microgram, one kilogram. And this unit was actually proposed that it should be done in 2005, but they waited till 2017-18 because the two measurements did not agree to the extent they should agree. And you can see that when even I come, supposed to come to the national levels where you are using the silicon kilogram, I have to be around 25 parts per million kind of, uh, uh, or 25 parts into 10 to the power 9. So it's an enormous amount of precision one is talking about. And I tell you, it is not easy. And it is difficult, very difficult. It takes years of measurement. You know, like we have this fantastic talk by Dr. <coughs> Mills Tobler before and see the level of precision that you are going to. So you can imagine that is why it is needed, why it is needed and how it should be done. So let me now tell you, just coming to mass, since we are talking about mass, this is the international, what is called the International Prototype Kilogram. This is what kept in Paris. It is in a vacuum and it's platinum meridian. All of us have a copy of it. Even India, NPL India has a copy of it. So this circulates around. And this is the, <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, this is the VIPM uh, cable balance, watt balance. And uh, then this watt balance essentially measures a force generated electromagnetically. And again, the force generated by one kilogram, like the weight always. And you can see something very interesting. This is the, it may not be the last one, but one of the recent ones. This is the reference value of a kilogram, the red dot. This is the, the deviation of the HIPK from the reference value. It is about 20 microgram for a kilogram. And this is the cobalt balance result from some of the leading labs in the world. 
So you can see that is where things are going to. And, with, and this particular equipment took years to build, years to perfect. And though it was proposed by Dr. Cable in NPL Teddington in, I think, 70s, he proposed it, but it took time to build it. So it was used to be called Watt Balance before. But after he died, it was to his honor, it is now called Cable Balance. And those who are doing interest in physics, just go to the BIPM site. There are beautiful brochures of how this is done, how it is realized. It's just fantastic. A lot of physics into it. <coughs> Dr. Riley has exposed you to the two modes of the uh, balance. And essentially, it is the, you know, you have mg being balanced against electrical force. And, you know, this velocity thing reminds me, all of you must have done things like Halliday Resnick book at one time or other in your school life when or you are going to college. You know, this is the problem which is in Halliday Resnick that you have a wire being moved in a magnetic field, what is the voltage developed between these two? And this is precisely what comes into this particular thing. Simple physics, <coughs> but <coughs> when you apply it, it becomes fantastic. Well, another one as briefly mentioned is the Avogadro project that was going and it's called Avogadro project for it. First started for measurement of Avogadro number, then it became the mass standard. And it is essentially a silicon sphere made from a silicon in got up 28 silicon. And you can see that here, all these are measurable. These two are constants and H appears over here. This is the mass of a silicon <coughs> silly, you know, sphere of volume VS. VS is approximately, as a, it has a diameter of approximately eight centimeter for a one kilogram silicon sphere. And all these are constants that get seen, and they have been developing since 2011. So the Avogadro project mass and what you get from the cable balance, they have to be same. So that is where things are going. Now I then come to the problem that ultimately I cannot go to a market and tell me, give me, you know, 1.4752 to 114 H new CS by C squared, but it will work from it. So how do I translate it? <coughs> So let me now ask this question <coughs> that we are defining now kilogram, even in the standards lab all over around, to around 25% in the power of nine. But when you go to a tonnage bridge where large things are weighed, and you may have seen it if you drive in the Indian highway, that's called Dharamkata. I don't know why they call Dharamkata, a large truck being weighed. And the best ones, the most well calibrated ones are not better than one part in 10 to power four, maybe even one part in 10 to power three. So then one's going to avoid the, you know, who the hell care? Even if it's one part in 10 to the power of four, should I care? And each development of one 10 over here, one, you move one 10, it improves. So let us see why it's so. So let's get into some number. So you look at the total food grain, rice, wheat, and coarse cereal produced in India annually at present is about 320 million tons. And milk production is about 210 million tons, large number. Now, if I say that I have 10 to the, and the price is about this type. Now you say that I have an uncertainty of one part in 10 to the power of four in measurement in this owing balance, which is a tonnage balance. So now what happens is that it will immediately have said that one million ton has an accuracy of 100 ton. Now, 100 ton means that for each 1 million ton, I have an inaccuracy in pricing about rupees 20 lakh or 2 million or 40 lakh or 4 million for milk. Now, I go to this number. Can you imagine how big that number is? It's an enormous number. And, you know, someone is uh, paying for it. You know, either the consumer or the producer. So that is where the precision measurement becomes important. <coughs> I will also now spend a little two minutes to tell you where is large volume usage, even a difference between 0.1 and 0.2% in the value becomes important. <coughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, why, is it, why is it important? If it is one consumer or one producer who is paying this enormous amount of money, that is important, I agree, but it's distributed 
So if sure, I to minus sure. But let us say yeah. one tenth of that, I am doing a trade with some country, and which is true. Like about ten to twenty percent of our food grains go outside. So that is one consumer is buying. You are right. Everyone is pitching a little bit different, so it doesn't matter. But there are bulk trades, and that is where the problem comes. <laughs> now, coming to bulk trade, let me, uh, the example I was taking, I was just going to NPL. Suddenly, I get a summon from Supreme Court of India that you have to appear. My goodness, Supreme Court is allowing you to appear. So only thing you can go is that you can become shaky. But luckily, they said that you have to appearing as a witness, so I'm not a culprit. What is the witness? So there's a huge fight between a company which makes electric meter, Usha Martin. They are the still uh, biggest electric meter making in the country, and Bihar State Electricity Board. And they said that uh, the State Electricity Board that they suspect that Usha Martin meters have a deficiency of 0.2 percent in measurement. Fine. Who the hell cares? <laughs> But then that 0.2% translated to, at that time, I'm talking of 98, 230 crore, that is, or 23 <coughs> billion rupees of loss to the state electricity board. So ultimately, Supreme Court said, you have to calibrate at least 50 of the Usha Martin meters and give it to the court. We had given about a month and a half. We did it and found out it was not 0.2%, it was 0.1% a little below. So both are winner or both are loser. So that is the way the case was decided. So that's why calibration is important when you're really coming to the marketplace. Now, when you come to international trade and to the outsourcing in manufacturing is very important. Like, you know, an aircraft made in Toulouse or in Seattle, you can outsource its parts from anywhere in the world. But how do I know that is exactly fitting that? If it doesn't fit, you get a Charlie Chaplin. And you know, so how big that can be? So the word that comes in over here is called conformity assessment. So the process is carried by a manufacturer to demonstrate whether specific requirements relating to a product have been fulfilled. And that is the next few slides I'll present them on. Now, <coughs> I'll give you a number, how serious these numbers are. So recently, there was a report that the Airbus said that they are getting almost good part of that technology design and product from India. How big is that in numbers? And this is a couple of years old number. One billion is what Boeing sources from India worth of part. And Airbus sources about 650 million worth of part. Now, <coughs> auto industries almost source a good part of it. And how large it is? The automobile industry in India is about $222 billion. And the part, spare parts, is about you know, $15 billion of that order. And uh, so question is that all these spare parts are going into some auto industry, either in India or in USA or Germany. So there is a large stringent requirement that a door which is of that size is really a door of that size. And that is where the conformity assessment becomes important. I just take one thing, which you who drive a slightly high-end car, uh, cars today, you get a computer screen in front of it. And that is called the advanced driver assistance system. Almost all modern cars have it. And <coughs> everything in that car appears there. And there are a lot of sensors being connected. And all of them has to be calibrated. But if you have an uncalibrated sensor, is worth not having that. So you are very happy that your petrol tank is not empty. So you are driving, but your petrol tank has become empty. So you suddenly discover that calibration of the sensor was wrong. So, you know, a lot of disasters can happen. And, you know, this conformity assessment or the metrology was there actually since the civilization started. I think Dr. Riley has given an example from Egyptian civilizations, and they are very stringent. And they have the uh, qubit. I call it qubit for, you know, why I call it qubit. They, you know, they had, I don't know, this name is very interesting. But nowadays, we also have qubits in a different context. But <coughs> <coughs> the punishment of non conformity was very severe. If the in charge of that construction site is not following conformity, 
his punishment is death. My goodness, you know. I think no country had that kind of conformity. <coughs> Even Harappan civilization has a fantastic metrology system, and it picked around this period when all other civilizations really mapped. Now, the historians say that this, ma this maturity in trade and town planning came because all the civilization and there's a lot of trade, like uh, standards which were developed in Harappan civilization found in Mesopotamia. So, you know, there are trade and these things went in. Just very quickly, this is the map of the Harappan civilization, and this is the weights, and their smallest weight is 13.7 gram. You know, it's a little funny number, but there are multiples of that weight. And uh, uh, just to put the map in perspective, this is Ropar, which is in Punjab, and Rakhigari, which is now in Haryana. These are the, so you can see the, where the map is located. But let us now see something very interesting. It has come up fairly about five, six years back by the Archaeological Survey of India. There's a place called Dhola Vira, where they have found fantastic collections of weights. They started wondering why in one place you have some, some fantastic accurate weights. They found out that is where they used to collect tax, like we have the goods and services tax in India. They also have a taxing system. So anyone bringing his product to the city has to get weight, pay the tax, get into the city. And so the guy who was collecting his tax, he had a fantastic calibration system. And <laughs> they also found this site called Lothal. And you can see how beautifully the towns used to be planned there. And their linear dimension was called a dhanush, which was about 1.9 meter. So the metrology, brick size, everything was, you know, every civilization needs it. And that is the message I like to give it. It is more getting arranged internationally and all that, but it existed for a long time. So let me come now back <coughs> to the conformity business. And uh, that is what uh, the question is that I am making a product over here. I have a calibration set up in my shop, or there's a nearby calibration lab, testing lab. I'm getting and generating a test certificate there. Will that be accepted in European Union or in USA or in Japan or in Korea or in China? So that's the biggest question. If not, then I have to have the calibration test certificate generated at each country I'm doing my trade with. So immediately if that happens, the cost goes up. So that is where the important thing came that got to have a system internationally. That is where <coughs> this is done in a way that is accepted globally. So what it means is that the meter in New Delhi is the same as the meter in Bangalore. The meter in New Delhi is same as the meter in Paris or in Germany or whatever. So this equivalence has to be established. And there should be a process of translating that. So how it is done? So there are two things that are done. One is the mutual recognition of each other's standards, realization in nutrient transparent process. <coughs> This is happening since 1999 when the MRA came into existence. And the important point is that you have an unbroken chain of calibration. That is, you who are calibrating to the highest apex standard today here, the next lab, then when he translate, he really knows what he has calibrated to. It is not that he has to do the same accuracy what he has done over here. He should have a stated accuracy, but that accuracy should be traceable to what have been measured in the highest lab. So, <coughs> and the units are not very arbitrary. You know, if you look into the BIPM, they're consultative committees. And you have people like Dr. Riley sitting in these consultative committees and they're true experts and giving, you know, you can see that the electrical magnetism and photometry, radiometry, you know, every, every, every important physical quantity has a consultative committee. <laughs> and the whole process goes through that. So this is the triangle you have to move in. The SI has been established. This is the International Calibration, National Calibration Facility. And then you come to the workplace. So what is done through that is the accredited calibration laboratory. So this is the bridge crossing that you are talking about. And this whole bridge crossing is dependent on two international agreements, just two. One is the meter agreements, which are signed in 1875 about 100 years 
after French Revolution, <coughs> and another mutual recognition agreement in 1999. It's a huge gap. This ensured that you'll be all following meters and kilogram. This ensured that my meter and kilogram is the same as your meter and kilogram. And there's a complete scientific process for it. It's not just I declare my system is same as your system. There got to be a process. So let us map this thing in the Indian scenario. <coughs> See, the country became independent in 47. Our first, our constitution was adopted in 1950. 52 is when the first election was held. And in the first parliament itself, they passed an important act. And there is the standard weight and measure second 1956, which made NPL as the you know, keeper of the standard. And it allowed us to sign the meter convention in 1957. At the time, the director was a very noted scientist, Professor K.S. Christian. And when we signed it, we got two things from, uh, uh, from Paris. One is copy number 57 of international kilogram and copy number four of the meter bar. They kept it NPL under a vault. And there are two keys with the director and they have to open every six months to check they are there. And whenever there is a comparison, international or national, you take it out. There's a way to take it out. There's a way to put it back in. Everything has a standard operating procedure. And this is what we did it. And this is the really building of the infrastructure in India. The MRA was signed in 1999. I was the honor of signing it on behalf of my country. But signing was not easy. For <coughs> it included a lot of challenges for if you want to have MRA, Mutual Recognition Agreement, there are stringent rules on the standards and realization units that you have to follow. So before signing, we actually approached the government. The, uh, you know, that was the time we had an audience, even with the prime minister. He listened to us for five minutes, no written documents. He just smiled and said, Otel Berry Bajpayee was prime minister at that time. He smiled at me and said, go ahead, sign it. <coughs> so then I said, sir, what about so much money that I need you to make a new building for standard? Ho jayega, I'll give you. So, you know, he was a very cool guy. Anyway, so this challenge, it started, the money ultimately came a little late. And in 2007 onwards, we were allowed to use the MRA logo in specified quantity. How you can see that it is already in BIPM site. And these three committees, time and frequency, mass, and <coughs> we are already a member of the uh, consultative committee. We have also our status. I understand they have all been now made into full membership, and few were admitted into the observer status. Okay. <coughs> now I have talked about the what NPL is doing or national metrology. Now, how do I do it in the accreditation business? You must have seen the logo all around particularly where you go to test your blood. The blood, uh, the guy who lab, which tests your path lab, which tests your lab, will proudly say NABL accredited. What does it mean? It means he has followed a process by which he got accreditation from this particular board. It's actually started as a project by Department of Science and Technology housed in NPL 83 and 1988 registered as a society. And this is the NPL's job, take part in the key comparison. There are regional organizations like we are part of the Asia Pacific Petrology Forum. We have Australia, strong lives like German, China, and uh, Korea. And we have to do all our MRA obligations. That's very important. And the accessibility and all this thing has been added by the accreditation services. <laughs> At present, we have a total of 8,517 calibrated labs. Uh, of course, calibration labs are 1140. A lot of labs are in the medical area. So you're, you can be sure that your pathological test report that you are going are mostly correct. And previously, you had that problem that you know you would do a test here, not match with the test to the next lab. But now things have really eased out. OK, now I change my gear. <coughs> and yeah. NBL, NBL. There are two accreditation. NBH, BH is for hospital, but NBL. See, there is now a document on chemical metrology, chemical and clinical metrology. So let me tell you where physics comes in. 
Importance is preparing of the uncertainty document. Type A, type B are now the uncertainties. We don't have the old fashioned uncertainty definition. Each of this calibration procedure, you got to you know, have a document. The first one NPL we prepared, it took us of six months for three or four quantities. So now each quantity you get calibrated, you got to have essentially that uncertainty document. And what happens is that many of the operators in this lab don't know what is uncertainty. You know, that is where really the problem comes, but things are moving fast. So let me now ask this question that this is the question I had, right? If I define current by charge by time, and if I define current by voltage by ohm, we get the same thing. So I try to do that. And if time permits, I'll go to what is called a programmable quantum current source. Now, one important physics law, which is at the heart of all calibration process, more or less, is this particular law, right? Where you show the electromagnetic force can be balanced by a mechanical force. Or a mechanical force, which is created something like by a gravity, can be balanced by electromagnetic force. And all the high precision work that is getting done uses this principle. But believe me, this equivalence has its application in other areas too. You know what is that area? Rocket launcher and torpedo launcher. See, rocket doesn't get ignited in the battlefield. I mean, it comes out from the battery. If it gets ignited within the battery, the battery will melt. So they're actually electromagnetic thrust. So you have a high current, and the AD force forces it out. Same with the torpedo. And uh, these are extremely kilo, a few tens or thirties of kilo ampere. In a short time, they pass through. And uh, so you, know, you have all the uh, so rockets and torpedo come out, and they get ignited, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> now, if you look into the electrical metrology, or if you look into the whole metrology field that now to be able to define everything in E, H, C, et cetera, now from two very important physics experiments, one is the Josephson effect, another is the quantum Hall effect. And they have actually changed the whole field of metrology and high precision electrical measurement become the central field. <coughs> okay, there is one, uh, and you can see that, but one thing we know that much before this thing, there is another quantity to which you know, which is now getting defined more closely, the unit of electrical charge. It's an amazing thing, this unit of electric charge, but the important point is that though we know it is quantized, it is not before the beginning of this century or ending of the last century that it is being utilized, particularly for precision measurement and metrology. I'll come to it. <coughs> the data that we take here are from this beautiful volume which came out in Reviews of Modern Physics. Well, <coughs> Millikan did his oil drop experiment and determination of heat about 100 years back. But as I said, that it is still new and millennium, we didn't realize that the quantized charge can be used. So this is very quickly, let me just tell you, in case you don't know how this is some junction is utilized, it is actually pumped with an AC, pretty you know, 70 gigahertz or of that order, and with an array of junction, and you get what is a step in the current and voltage curve, and that's called Shapiro step. And so the voltage that you develop is in unit of H by 2 into F and Kj, which is Josephson constant, which is 2E by H, so it's Josephson junction inverse. So if you look H by 2E, then I come to my question over there. What is the unit of flux quantum? Unit of flux quantum is H by 2E. And you know, <coughs> that comes directly over here. So the voltage that you are developing is actually few flux quantum. So there's a very fundamental quantity. You'll pretty soon see the, the same flux quantum also comes in uh, your quantum Hall effect. Though the way they enter is very different but the flux quantum comes. So what quantizes the Shapiro step and what quantizes the, your voltage standard, the flux quantum, H by 2E. So I'll request that if you can go back to some of your basic physics books, you can see that. And so this is the inverse of the flux quantum. 
and code data has given as the value. <laughs> now you can buy actually this is some junction array. In NPL, we purchased 1.014 volt voltage standard before now the 10 voltage standard is there. The 70,000 Josephson junction, and uh, uh, these are the Sapiro steps that you see, and you really tune into one of the steps and get your uh, voltage. And typically, we radiate it about, uh, you know, <coughs> 70 gigahertz of that order. And then you can actually use your GPS kind of uh, frequency standard to take that thing going in. But one thing I must tell you, you know, the solid state phenomena which are being used very extensively today in the metrology has become possible due to progress in the microfabrication. That all the microfabrication process which was in the silicon industry got translated and you could make this kind of microfabrication. So there's a 70,000 Johansson junctions inside it. And the Johansson junctions nowadays, in this one in particular, is a layer of niobium, the layer of niobium silicide, then there's another layer of niobium. So these are you know, real technical subjects. <coughs> now coming to quantum Hall effect, we also know that this is a fantastic experiment. You have a quantum Hall bar, you pass a current, and this is the transverse voltage that gives you the Hall voltage, and this is the longitudinal voltage that gives you the resistance. Now, these are essentially done on a gallium arsenide substrate and two-dimensional electron gas strata, et cetera. <coughs> Important point is, if I define a Hall resistance, which is this voltage divided by the current, then it is quantized in units of RK. So your RK is H by E square. So now I come to my, this question over here, just uh, before your dinner, if you are not very hungry, just work out and show by h by e square is actually ohm. You know, very funny, right? You have joule second and you have coulomb square. Why should you give it ohm? You just work it out. And you know, you could soon found that it happens. Otherwise, everything will go hey, why? It's not happening. And <coughs> nowadays there are systems available commercially, like uh, uh, this is a PTB which is sells this ones. And nowadays, many of the low temperature equipment manufacturers who make superconducting magnet, they give you a package. Buy my magnet, buy my crust, that I'll give you the whole voltage and the Jesuson function at a reduced price. So, if you are setting up a metrology lab, you don't have to do much research to get your standard. You get it, but then your hard work starts to realize it in your lab and translate it, et cetera, et cetera. So, you can see that. That even at a very modest field of 10 Tesla, you have reached you know, th th nearly 12.5, <coughs> 1300 kilo ohm, uh, 13, uh, 13 kilo ohm, and that is RH by two. These are very precise, and this is your resistance standard now. So now I come to the last part of the talk and ask a question that, <coughs> there's a thing called, metrology triangle in electrical units. And that brings me to the last question. So I can define a current by charge by time. I can define a current through Ohm's law, volt by Ohm, RT equivalent. So let us see what the present experiment tell us. So essentially let us have the F heart frequency, which is, I can have a good standard today. Ampere, <coughs> I can generate through this road, or I can generate through so this is coming from your single electron charging. And let us see that, what is single electron charging? Now, <coughs> just a second. Now my question was that I can charge a picofarad to one volt or 100 kilo ohm. I should see in this curve. Why don't I see the quantization? Now let me get some quick answer. I should be seeing it, right? Charge is quantized, so why don't I see it? Any question? Temperature. The biggest democratic force on Earth is temperature. It equalizes everything. You, any quantum effect, it washed out by temperature. Thermal Batu couple. So <coughs> all the beautiful optical experiments you saw, 
their main difficulty was to decouple it from the thermal bar. Only then you see the quantum effect. It is the same thing that happens even in the case of this capacitor charging, that you know, if you calculate E square by 2C is your charging energy, and 300K is equivalent to 25 MeV, 0.3K is 25 micro electron volt. So unless this quantity is substantially larger than this, you will not see the Coulomb charging, that is individual electron. There is yet another important thing, which comes from uncertainty relation. And you can quickly see that if I'm charging it through a resistor RT, that capacitor, then by using the uncertainty relation, you can find out that the charging resistance should be more than 2H by E square, much more. So I know this is of the order of 25 kilo ohm or of that order. So I should be charging it at least by 100 kilo ohm or by MeV ohm. So the delta T that I get <coughs> is actually uh, not very uncertain that way. So let me now ask a question. This is the charging energy. So let us try to define a ratio of charging energy by KVT. And if I have a metal sphere of radius A, and I can immediately find out what is the capacitance of that metal sphere, so many farads, then you must obtain into diameter. Now, if I'm sitting at 300K, this ratio is not more than one till I go to one nanometer. Now, one nanometer is a, a, a tricky size for a metal, but you get oxidized unless I know how to create it. <laughs> and that too, this ratio is not very high. So I sit at room temperature, I can easily cool down to 0.3K. So there, even if I have metal nanoparticles of 100 nanometers, I can safely get it up there 10 to 3, and one can observe this single electron charging. This is one of the first single electron charging. This is a gate which controls the voltage over here, and there's a metal particle sitting over. This is the Called the source and drain. So the current that goes through it can be controlled by this gate, and the gate charges this. And you can see that what happens when I change the gate voltage. So the straight line then becomes a really step as the electron goes in and you know is formed. And if I look into the <laughs> conductance of that, I see that there are spikes. So the beautiful spikes occurring at a voltage which is essentially you can determine from the capacitance. So that is how the single electron transistor came. And let us see how I can get a current standard. You know, this is like something like a turnstile. Turnstile is a gate, you know. You want to go from this side to this side, that's a gap. You cannot come from the other side. If you want to come, you have to jump, you know, people do that. But uh, what happens is that if I put a timer with the turnstile, I can calculate the human flow or the human current. Exactly the same thing does a, you know, a, a single electron transistor that I can pump it with a frequency and that should give me <laughs> the current. <laughs> and uh, these are some of the details I cannot get in now. A beautiful thing I want to show you, the, the more recent ones. Uh, Dr. Martin Aknoop has talked about the uh, beautiful saddle point that you get. You can also create a saddle point on few charges on a gallium arsenide by arranging the gates. So what you do in this case is that you just uh, bias it at the frequency that you want to pulse it, and that gives you a beautiful current pump from which you can define your current. So you need a current pump that have 20 pulses of electron within so many nanoseconds. That should give me the pump. <coughs> well, so let us now see uh, this question that is, <coughs> Okay, let us now see this uh, particular issue that I came to, uh, that is whether they're equivalent. They're equivalent. And how do I do that? I just quickly not get into the details. <coughs> okay, so now I can define, as I said, the current from here. I can define, so what I'll do is that I'll take a voltage standard from a precession voltage standard connected to a resistor which is defined by the quantum hall standard, and I'll get a specific current going through it. And I'll compare that current with the current that I'm getting from the first, this relation, which is charged by time. And how do I compare current? There's a thing called cryogenic current comparator. That is where you have superconducting transist, uh, transformer sitting at low temperature. <coughs> and the output of that is monitored by a screen monitor that with an enormous precision that you can get. 
And this is the way people have established that one can really have the current equivalent, whatever we will find. Now, I think this is the time for me to stop and uh, I'll don't get current to, uh, if someone is interested. So what I did is that I just thought that I will convince you that it is not only that the position measurement that is at the metrology, <coughs> but the impacts really spills over international trade. And it encompasses knowledge from different fields. Is not in one field. If you look into the, all the precision measurements talked about in the school and going around, it is encompassing different knowledge fields. It's not exactly one field that is working. So the metrology and precision measurement when you do, it actually encompasses different knowledge fields. And if you look into, I don't know whether you care to look into the publication, some of the speakers who are they are mostly in PRLs or nature level of papers. You get good papers by doing high quality measurement or metrology. But it's difficult, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not that in the morning you load your cluster by afternoon, get your result by coffee time, your paper is ready. Sometimes it's years that it takes to do this kind of measurement. And one thing very important is that this particular field can adopt latest development on the physics or physics related area that is happening. So I think this is the best time to stop. I have a few more minutes for questions. So thank you for being so patient at this time of the day. <laughs> thank you, Varudha. <clears throat> Any questions? Um, so, uh, maybe I missed something uh, in the uh, mass uh, standard measurement, uh, that uh, kilogram measurement, yeah. are you measuring mg uh, because... No, uh, you are measuring actually h. You are uh, measuring mg. Mg. You are balancing then, it by the yeah, mg balance. and comparing with uh, h. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then g varies from place to place, right? No, no. Uh, so you, know, you are actually taking the standard mass and uh, compare that with the prototype mass with the mass that is coming to you. So you are not exactly taking the G value. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a very important question, but G varies. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a completely theoretical possibility, but a fun question to entertain. So a lot of us, even in this room, are looking for uh, evidence for variation of fundamental constants with time. Exactly. And, and, and oscillation, right? Yeah. So <laughs> what will happen? Uh, to, to these aspects that you discussed. Yeah, I think that's the best to ask to my friends from NIST or PTV, or you know, you are right. Particularly G is, you know, capital G is something yeah. like that. No, I think uh, I somehow feel, you know, by that time you find the variation, none of us will be around. Yeah, actually, maybe <laughs> I can comment a little bit. I mean, let's say if you find a variation of fundamental constant of alpha, uh, which is, very, very small in yeah. numbers over per year. And the if you look into the uh, like present accuracy <laughs> of any of these uh, SI units, these are much, much at a higher level. So yeah. this variation of constant won't really play any role for, at this moment, at least for the SI definition. Of no, no, but you know, that but is the assumption. Yeah, yeah. 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 Related to that only. See, oh, let us consider that example you have given, okay? So you want to measure uh, current. So either you measure using the fast formula, like you measure charge and time, then you extract you know, current from that, or you measure voltage and uh, you know, resistance, oh, then yeah. you know, extract like that. But when you measure this, you know, these values may like, you know, uh, change differently, you know, uh, in different yeah, units. But you uh, know, what happens is that if you look into it, yeah. That's why I say there are certain sacrosanct physical constants that you should ask. That this is E, yeah. uh, the reception constant, and the von Friedling constant. They are fixed values. No, so no. Again, again, uh, like <coughs> they are not fixed. Like the numbers you gave. Mm -hmm. So up to that precision, they they are fixed. 
but what like you know the marriage no, 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 of fine structure I'm constant sure or 10 years after this vip yeah 10 years is not like no you know, year time period we are looking for like uh, if uh, we believe that alpha varies then from there one can also you know believe that you know, ma- that uh, electric charge may vary sure over time or mass of you know uh, you know this quantity may you know vary over time see the, so that then, variation is far less than the variation in the stock market so i think we should <laughs> yeah <laughs> It is actually an interesting aspect. Uh, so, um, so it used to be that people said that it is uh, not allowed to talk about variation of uh, G. Why? Because G has dimensions. And uh, then what are you comparing it to? So, so it, that you are only allowed to talk about variation of dimensionless constant. In, in recent years, this uh, point of view has changed actually, because um, if instead of a monotonic variation, you have, for example, uh, an oscillation of the, of the value, uh, then you can self-reference to the, yeah, to the yeah, yeah. time average well. But, uh, but there are a lot of interesting conceptual questions here, uh, I think. No, I think, uh, I think uh, these are very important issues, you know, and that is where precision measurements are important. <laughs> okay, any other questions? <laughs>